Good evening. Welcome, friends and honored guests. For reasons that are not entirely clear to me, I've been asked to chair this evening's festivities. I think that Billy Crystal didn't respond to his invitation. <laughs> this afternoon was about science. Edgar, have a nice day. <laughs> so this evening will be about non-science. Some old friends and colleagues will share with you recollections of life with and without Edsger. I certainly remember when I first met him. I was a brand new assistant professor at Cornell, and he was my idol, and I was scared to death of him. Greece introduced me. He was sitting in David's office reading some memos. I walked in and I said, Professor Dijkstra, it's a great privilege to meet you. And he looked up and said, yes, I'll bet it is. <laughs> he was in town because we were going to spend the next summer teaching together at Santa Cruz. Greece had agreed to give a one-week short course on uh, what David called science of programming and Edsger had called discipline of programming. And uh, the series was sold out. So the organizer, Bill McKeeman, had decided to get a second instructor, and the backup instructor was Edsger. David was going to have one class, and I was his assistant. It's a good way to learn the material. And Dijkstra was going to have the other class, and Vim was his assistant. Well, a f day or so into the class, I was sitting in the back of the room dozing. I assume Vim was sitting in the back of Edsger's room dozing. And Edsger said something. I wasn't there, I don't know what it was, but the earth moved. 5.6 on the Richter scale. So now you're going to understand why I have trouble believing that anyone who says Dijkstra is someone who's resigned or retiring. The man is clearly capable of neither, and that's what we love about him. Let me now introduce our first speaker. There once was a David of Greece whose friendship would give you no peace. For his rhythms and rhymes scribed to mark happy times brought constant invites for speech. Greece? So you probably don't all know Yesterday, you probably all don't know that yesterday was Edsger's birthday. I think it was his 70. Ah. Let's not clap. Let's sing him happy birthday the way Americans do. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Edsger. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Many of the computer scientists who have influenced my life are in this room. Well, Sir Anthony is not in this room, but he will be here tomorrow. Uh, but there's Donald Knuth and uh, Wirt, Misra, and I might even mention the youngster Schneider, uh, just to name a few of them. But none has inspired me as much as you know who, Edsger W. Dijkstra. I've walked much of my career in his footsteps, although I do admit to straying away from time to time, much to his dismay. My text, The Science of Programming, is probably better called Dijkstra for the Masses because all it did was try to make palatable for undergraduates what he had done so well in his research monograph about four years before that. Uh, I've not always been a fan of his. My first sight of him was in Garmisch, Germany in 1968 at a famous NATO conference. Doug McElroy gave a banquet speech there on the use of components, which we heard were so bad today. Uh, I also remember this one guy, this, uh, I didn't know who it was, very strange, 
walking around in his bare feet or socks on, pausing every once in a while, saying a few words, pausing again. I had no idea who it was, just that it was a little bit strange. For the next few years, I tried to read the work of this guy called Dykstra, and I didn't know it was this guy in the stocking feet. And I just could not understand very well what was going on and what his point was. It just didn't come to me the way I, everybody else said it was good, but I didn't know. Then Chance, I guess it was Chance, placed us back to back teaching at a summer school in Maryland. He teaching operating systems, me teaching compiler writing. I listened to his lectures. Elaine, my wife, and I taught Edsger and Rhea how to throw a frisbee, which had just come on the scene a few years before that. Um, and that week was an eye-opener for me. Watching her perform, talking with him, talking with Rhea, thereafter I had no difficulty reading Edsger's work. In fact, it was fun, and it caused me to change what I was doing drastically. He tried to pick a fight with me once, an intellectual fight. He, I came down with a copy of my book on compiler writing, and he started opening it up to the chapter on runtime storage administration, and he said, I don't like the way this is written. And that's because he had most, more than anybody else to do with the development of the stack and runtime storage administration. And I said, well, you know, it could have done that, that, I could have done it much better. This was my first attempt. It'll be much better in the second edition. And that floored him. There was no fight. He had nothing he could say to that. Um, he visited us that fall. He stayed with us. He had just learned about his Turing Award, which he got that fall in 1972, and I'm proud to say that he started writing it, his Turing Award lecture, in my office. Ever since, my wife and I have enjoyed and benefited from the friendship of Edsger and Rhea, and I have benefited tremendously with collaboration over the years. He is the only person I know of who writes regularly to me. And he's the only person I know of who writes probably to half the people in this room regularly. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, thing that he does in that sense. Corresponds with many people. I don't know where he finds the, find the time for it. One of the qualities that has always impressed me was Edsger's way with words. His ability to turn a phrase. For him, words, that's W-O-R-D-S, really has the S at the front of it, S-W-O-R-D. And he's able to cut through the baloney and get at the essence by using the words. The only person I know of who matches this almost is Tony Hoare. <clears throat> For example, one paper that he didn't like started with, as a point of departure, we'll use X's idea. Well, Edsger didn't like X's idea. And in writing a review of this paper, he said, yes, indeed, we will take that advice and depart as far as possible from X's idea as possible. <coughs> Here's another example from a trip report, and I'll give it in rhyme. And I think this is why Fred started off with his little limerick. It has to do with the fact that, historically, Edsger has been a meat and potato man with a very sensitive digestive system. Femke, his daughter, the deer, was in Ithaca for over a year. He visited she and Elaine and me a few times during that year. One fatal eve for a lark, she took him with Cynthia Dwark. Uh, this is an aside. Uh, Cynthia Dwark happens to be a person, I believe, who went with him. She is in this little limerick only because it rhymes well. <laughs> One fatal eve for a lark, she took him with Cynthia Dwark to a nationally known vegetarian throne. Moosewood was the restaurant. That night, he just couldn't sleep. F food drove through his gut like a jeep. Was it edible? No! Now indigestible! Oh! He wrote at a quarter to three. <laughs> 
Edsger's phrase, late that night, I found out that the food was not only inedible, but also indigestible, has stayed with me for a long time. Now, we all know that Edsger doesn't sit well with everyone. And I figured out why. There were two reasons. First, he's honest to a fault. There is not a shred of hypocrisy in him, and he has the courage to speak what he thinks. Second, he thinks before he speaks, which is unheard of for most people. Put the one, the powder with the other, the light, and fireworks ensue. A question will be put to him. There'll be a period of silence while he actually thinks. Then comes an answer that may startle and cut to the quick, not because it was meant to, but because it was truthful and ever so penetrating. Jerry Salton, God rest his soul, said it well after reading one of his strip reports. Edsger's right, but damn it, you don't just say such things. <laughs> well, Edsger did, and actually we're all better off because he did. His honesty, his courage, his penetrating mind have helped us all in computer science, whether computer science liked it or not. So here's a few more limericks to go with that. Not all people have taken the time to see Edsger's reason and rhyme. From these very dense louts, we hear so much shouts, beauty's his business, not mine. <laughs> these pe people are missing a treat, a commodity rare and upbeat. His ideas are supreme. Waves of phrasing, a dream. C.S. owes so much at his feet. Computational complexity is great, but not so in Edsger's pate. Computing simplicity, elegance, and beauticity are served up on Edsger's plate. Now, I think we've talked all this whole day about Edsger. And something should be said of Rhea. I want to salute Rhea as well as Edsger. Edsger would not have been the man he is without her at his side, supporting him, working with him, keeping him in check, urging him on. We honor him at his retirement. I believe we should honor her as well. Thank you for your help. Many of us have a wife, or I should say in these modern days a spouse, upon whom we rely much more than we like to admit. These wives deserve at least half the credit we get, and probably more. Of course, marriage these days don't always last as long as they used to. This one has lasted a long time. I remember telling my son, who just got married two years ago, I took him aside the way fathers do, father and son together, you know, and I said, son, this is very important. You only get married three times. <laughs> well, I didn't really say that. So let me end. There's a lot of speakers on here, so I won't uh, say half of what I would like to about these two, because they've meant so much to me. So let me end with a few more limericks to both of them. To Rhea and Edsger, a pair. Your lives have been ever so rare. As one have you prospered and C.S. fostered. It's one life that together you share. We salute you as one, O oh, our friend, but we know this is not yet your end. Retirement, yeah, but goodbye, not a prayer. It's not at all your last amen. There's no need for us to shed tears. You'll be with us for many more years. We laugh with you now. Of you too, we're so proud. To Rhea and Edsger, three cheers. Is that okay? 
So David, I want to let the cat out of the bag. There were four people at that dinner at Moosewood. I felt terrible. <laughs> but I ended up marrying somebody else. The next, <laughs> the next speaker is somebody who knows Edgar in many, many contexts. Um, and if, if Greece is a ham, this is the real ham, Hamilton Richards. <laughs> Well, Jay asked whether I would give a short speech at this banquet oh, months ago now, and I could hardly refuse. It's the least I could do to honor a great friend, and the ambiguity in that phrase is quite deliberate. And of course, the honor's mine. But then I began to wonder what I would do with my eight minutes, which is what Jay allotted me. I could add my little epsilon to the tributes that have been pouring in, well-deserved as they are. But I decided maybe it would be better to do something that perhaps I was in a slightly unique position to do for whatever it's worth. So maybe you'll bear with me for a few reminiscences. I mean, it's only about seven minutes left. So. <clears throat> I haven't known Esger for as long as many of you or worked with him as closely as many of you. The distinction that I claim is that as far as I know, I'm the only person who has had the good fortune to know Edsker in three of his roles. As a Burroughs Fellow, I should say THE Burroughs Fellow, there was only one. They broke the mold after they made him. As a UT professor and as a close neighbor. My first contact with Edsker came when I was recruited to Burroughs Corporation in San Diego back in 1976. One of the chief attractions of the job was that Dijkstra keeps us honest. During the next two years, I saw Edgar only occasionally, and it was just as a member of the audience of the short courses he used to give for uh, Burroughs folks in Southern California. And in 1978, uh, the project I was on at Burroughs turned a bit sour, and Joanne and I end up, ended up moving to Austin to help start the Burroughs Austin Research Center. Fortunately, Edgar soon became a frequent visitor to, to Bark, as we called it. He would give talks and hold discussions, and best of all, he would work with us individually. One day, he com complained that the writing table at the Hilton Hotel was really not very good. So I invited him to come and work at our house in the afternoon. And before very long, Hotel Richards was Edgar's usual place to stay on his visits to Austin. And we came to know Edgar at pretty close quarters. We grew to know his vast musical tastes, all the way from Haydn to Mozart, with, oh, with Dvorak thrown in. His, his, his taste in cheese, not. And his conversational style, which David has already referred to, those long pauses while he thinks of just the right words. Esker takes conversation seriously. It's for communication, not just for the avoidance of silence. Esker's habit of extreme punctuality, la politesse du roi, as he's pleased to call it. His collection of word processors, mostly made by Mont Blanc. His relentless drive to improve his English. His English is already much better than mine, but he keeps working on it. And drags mine along in the process by asking very penetrating questions. Edgar's quite, an, like many philosophers, he's quite a navel gazer, but he gazes at other people's navels. <laughs> <laughs> Joanne reminded me of his unflappability one afternoon, pretty early in his visits to our house, when he lay on the, on the carpet in our living room while our two-year-old son piled him from, he from head to toe with pillows. And, the great man was completely unfazed by this invasion of his privacy. Well, we always looked forward to his visits, and he made quite a few to, to Bark, and he and the, and the Austin Research Center seemed to get a lot out of each other. And of course, it was too good to last. By 1984, Burroughs had been taken over by the accountants and had lost its interest in science. And Esker's visits began to include longer and more serious visits to the local university. 
And I remember uh, Mani Chandi and Jay Misra would come to the door of our house and take Edgar away and bring him back sometime later. It was clear something was afoot. And if, sure enough, eventually it was announced that Edgar was leaving Burroughs for UT. The Burroughs technical community was highly dismayed, and the regrets of his Dutch colleagues must have been very profound. My regrets, however, were very mixed. Too bad for Burroughs, but Edgar would be moving to Austin, so we'd see more of him. But my good fortune didn't end there. The house which Edgar and Rhea made their home turned out to be just a few minutes' walk from our house. Eight minutes, Edgar tells me. <laughs> In one direction. That's downhill. Uphill, maybe a little more. So Edgar and Rhea have been our neighbors for 16 years now, and they've become our very dear friends. They often drop in of an evening, often in the course of their evening walks around the neighborhood. Sometimes they come just for coffee, always iced coffee, of course, and sometimes to spend the evening. And if a week goes by without a visit, I definitely have the feeling that there's something missing. So what does one say about a great man who is also one's dear friend and mentor, who has had a profound effect on one's modes of thought, standards of thought, standards of expression and of teaching. Well, there's so much I could say, but you've all heard so much already. Let me just say one thing. I do recall thinking back in the early days at the Burroughs Austin Research Center that Edgar had such valuable insights and so much to contribute that it was a pity that he seemed to sort of raise up a bow wave in front of himself. It seemed that the way he expressed his message sometimes seemed to create unnecessary resistance to it. But over the years, I've come to believe that the bluntness of his message is an inseparable aspect of it. Honesty compels Edgar to say what people need to hear, not what they want to hear. And his many honors and awards and the overflow crowd that's gathered for this symposium are ample evidence that there are many of us who are thankful to hear what we need to hear and are exceedingly grateful to Edgar for expressing so many insights and inventions so clearly and for showing us the way so fearlessly and for taking the flack so tirelessly. This is a stubbornness for which the Dutch are renowned, put to its best and highest use. So you may have noticed reading your program that the symposium committee have been working up a website containing all of Edgar's typescripts and manuscripts. I'm happy to report that we have scanned all of the EWD series, 1,100 documents, numbered 28 through 1,292, and we trust the series will continue and Edgar's PhD thesis, and it amounts to 6,461 pages. The Mathematical Center report should bring it to around 7,000 pages, all of it of the highest quality. This website will be open to the public when the collection's organization and presentation reach a standard that is befitting the man that we are, are honoring tonight. And it will also burn a snapshot of the site onto a CD-ROM as a memento for all of you, for everyone who's registered for the symposium. So you can look for it in your mailbox later this summer and watch the website for the latest EWDs. You're all on the mailing list now. Thank you all for coming. And thank you, Edsker, for all the inspiration. And we'll hope to see you again in another 10 years. We've heard that Edgar's worked in a number of areas during his career, operating systems, languages, compilers, programming methodology, and logic. It shows a mental agility. Put another way, it shows an ability to adapt to the circumstance. The next speaker is somebody who's even more adaptive, or should I say adaptable, than Edgar. Professor Tursky of Warsaw University has lived under more different kinds of government than I have ever studied. <laughs> Vlad.
It's all about stability. Ah, uh, Rhea, Asger, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, friends. Ah, uh, it's a unique occasion which brought us together tonight and for this wonderful symposium. It's very unlikely that exact repetition will ever happen with this company. Another 70 years for most of us is, mm, well, certainly for me. Uh, there are many ways in which I could have started and developed this little speech. I could have started recalling an evening in Nunyan when uh, Edgar was totally baffled because uh, Andrei Yershov and I and Femke were discussing intricacies of Slavonic grammars. You should have seen his face. Now, there was a subject on which three intelligent people were having lively conversation, and he didn't know a thing about it. <laughs> uh, I could have started this presentation, this talk, recalling how in the 80s, when martial law was imposed in Poland, we kept on our correspondence with letters opened by the military censor and we managed to develop a little cipher of our own in during this conversation which was read by the censors. Uh, that was interesting exercise. And I could tell you how important these letters were for me then, coming from the world and bringing the, well, stability, bringing the belief, the certainty that human reason is invincible. Very important things. Uh, I could tell you how we've met. I think that apart from family and maybe a Dutchman or two, I am the person who knows Edgar longest. We've met in 65 in Princeton, 2.1 meeting. That makes it 20, what, five? That's 35 years. You know, my counting ability is not very great. Uh, that's why I took up computing. I, 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 I could tell you about these stream of letters which continues for more than quarter of century now with number going to about 500 each way very large box uh, but I decided not to I'm not going to start or talk about these things I'm going to talk about myself Uh, well, Fred mentioned I lived under many forms of government, yes. I did many things in my life. I was astronomer. I had a decent profession once. Um, well, solid science, you know. Uh, I didn't make any big contributions to science and it's very unlikely I will ever make them, uh, considering the age. 
I view myself as a teacher. I think I spend a lot of time on teaching and I'm proud to see in the audience here some people who to a certain degree, well, so, whom I didn't scare away at least from science. And this is in this capacity that I derived most benefit from Edgar. And, well, you know about his technical writings. They're quite all right. Uh, they're quite influential. A number of bright people have taken them up and develop. And there is blindingly good quality in them, but you know all about it. The symposium is about it. I want to tell you how important Edgar is for me as a point of reference, an intellectual integrity in thing which is becoming rapidly, too rapidly old-fashioned, the view on university and its primary function to be good, to be honest, not to be the place where content is packaged and distributed over a network or somewhere to larger masses because there's a good business policy. We are all under tremendous pressure these days to commercialize, to prostitute the universities. Sometimes I think even the verb to prostitute is too noble sounding. I do know verbs which are stronger but after iced tea rather than strong drinks I don't use these words. <laughs> these verbs. If we be lucky enough and universities as we know them and as we cherish them will be still around in 10 or 20 years. We should remember that it is because it is that people like Edgar deserve our eternal gratitude for being the, the source of ethics, scientific, pedagogical ethics, or ethic, David, ethic, without C at the end, even though we may continue this discussion separately. Uh, the ethic which is so much needed in this world, which unfortunately is changing to the worse, and as the first speaker today mentioned that Edgar had something to do with it, uh, I don't know whether he really invented kiss-proof lipstick. That I would, well, perhaps he has, perhaps he hasn't. That's neither here nor there. But I certainly say that he is not responsible to 
any degree for the corruption of learning by means of computers. If anything, it's, I mean, th th this has to be corrected, this statement. Uh, he is for the intellectual integrity of university teacher. And having this point of reference nearly all my adult life helped me to be a tolerably good teacher. You see, I, I'm a weak character. I, I think I could have been seduced and corrupted. And if I am not entirely seduced and corrupted, I owe that to Edgar. And I am very grateful for this. And I am very grateful for this that every second or third week when I get you a letter, I know it's a letter from very wise man. And sometimes it carries also news about Ria, and then it's very cheerful. And thank you, Ria, for that as well. And thank you all for listening to me. Thank you. Some of you know what it's like to work for Dijkstra. Some of you know what it's like to work with Dijkstra. But very few people know what it's like to have Dijkstra work for them. The next speaker is also an ex-scientist. Dean Marianne Rankin once was a biologist, and now she's a dean. Marianne. <laughs> Well, I want it known right now that I don't regard myself as an ex-scientist. It's possible to still do science and be a dean. You just can't do very much of it. But it's, a, it's an honor to have a few moments here to um, give some of my reflections on Edsger. Uh, he is actually the one computer scientist I, I probably shouldn't admit this in this group, but the, the one computer scientist that I had heard of before I became dean, um, <laughs> I, I mean, uh, you know, on an individual basis, he's one of, of course, you know, he's one of these apocryphal figures that there are lots of stories circulating about, and um, I, I still believe the stories I heard about him when I was a biologist <laughs> years before I became a dean. I'm not sure whether or not they actually are true, but they should be. Um, <laughs> I heard, and I don't know if this is true, but uh, I heard that, first of all, that he was one of the founders of computer science, and I do believe that, and uh, this is clearly uh, borne out by the folks here, but that he would not use a computer. Is this true? Um, he, and that he wouldn't have one on his desk? This, but he does now? That's wonderful. He has an email address. Yes, I know I have it actually. I send him email. I also heard uh, that when he was recruited here, uh, one of his uh, conditions for joining the faculty was that we would provide him with an unending supply of Mont Blanc pens. Is that true? <laughs> In any case, uh, when I became dean, um, I realized uh, actually that this was not such an unusual thing to have done because actually when you recruit people, um, chair level people, uh, very special people, you have to do very special things and so that didn't, didn't seem such an unusual possibility. But in any case, 
Uh, before I met him and had heard all this about him, I expected him to look like Moses or uh, you know, <laughs> possibly carrying the Ten Commandments with him. And, and actually, the first time I spoke to the computer science department, I had the same experience that David Grease described, where um, I made some sort of remarks at the department, and I, I saw this uh, youthful sort of uh, uh, funny man. I mean, he was making sort of funny remarks uh, at the back of the room, and I enjoyed a little uh, exchange with him, and I... Uh, had no idea that this was the great Edsker Dijkstra. So uh, it was a sort of a, an awakening. And uh, since then, I have found that actually, in contrast to your experience with him, he's actually one of the most charming and courtly people I've ever met. And um, I don't either I'm seeing another side of him or uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe he behaves differently to Dean's or than he does to his colleagues and his subordinates. But anyway, it's been it's been an honor to be um, the dean of a college in which Edgar was one of the faculty, and uh, certainly he's been uh, one of the most important um, forces that has made this computer science department. Uh, the very strong, um, very highly respected department that it is. And, you know, uh, uh, lots of, uh, Dean spent a lot of time uh, trying to think up ways to get faculty to retire and uh, make room for new folks and everything. But I have to tell you, when I heard that Dr. Dykstra was retiring, I got a little bit um, sick in my stomach. I, I really hope that it doesn't mean that we're going to lose him, that he's going to stay and uh, continue working with the department so that we can continue to claim him, so that he can continue to have the wonderful influence he has had on this department and the students here, and that uh, we will uh, continue to profit by this wonderful association that we've had these last several years. So I mean this very seriously. I hope that he will continue to be a major force here. Thanks. That's right, UT lost Dykstra on Rankin's watch. <laughs> I could say a lot about the next speaker. It's Christoph Apt. I guess my job is to put his remarks in context, or at least to put Christoph in context. I could say a lot to do that, but I'll just point out one thing. He was on the faculty here for about three years. And then he was gone. He was in Europe, and Edgar was still here. Christoph, <laughs> please tell us what you said. I think one thing I learned from Edgar is that you should stay on course. So I will continue with my preparation and my prepared speech. So let me start with uh, mentioning that uh, I will briefly talk about two themes which the other speakers already developed. One is RIA. I think that uh, RIA has played a very important role in Edgar's life and she has always stood by him, next to him, and uh, in some ways I recognize a certain deep stability in Edgar and this can only happen if it comes from home next to him and therefore I thought that the right person to thank to start with is Ria and I thought I should buy something appropriate for her but I was worried that if I buy something for Ria it could become also for Edgars. I wanted to prevent this. So what is it? Cheese. <laughs> Now, the other paradox is that uh, Vlad Tursky spoke as the only Pole who was ahead before me speaking and the only other Pole who will speak today about intellectual integrity. I showed uh, uh, Chris Edmondson the word intellectual integrity underlined in what I briefly wrote before I came here. And to some extent, perhaps it plays a very important role in our hearts and minds. So I felt, in spite of the fact that 
Uh, Vlad developed this theme extremely cogently and properly. I would still like to say my few words about it. Uh, so I would like to focus on Edgar's intellectual integrity as a scientist and as a private person. So I'll just mention a few facts. He never added his name to a publication unless he substantially contributed to it. And he's one of the very few scientists I know who has mostly worked on his papers alone. It's very rare nowadays. He never followed any fashions. In fact, he rather created them. It's also very rare. And he was never interested in any financial rewards and throughout his career has remained a modestly living person. And regrettably, nowadays these are very rare qualities in our profession. Additionally, as we all know too well, and I will not repeat what the others said, he has made great contributions to science. And this brings me to the following quotation from a lecture of Richard Feynman. There are great ideas developed in the history of men, and these ideas do not last unless they are passed purposely and clearly from generation to generation. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a work to do. Thank you. Manny Chandy is special in very many ways. Uh, one of them we saw earlier today. He's the only computer scientist I know who not only enjoys giving le lectures with Edsker in the audience, but he enjoys baiting Edsker in those <laughs> lectures. So let me tell you how we got Edsker to Texas. Uh, I remember this very, very well. I remember the department's discussions before we got Edsker, before we made the offer to Edsker. I remember the whole process by which we, we got Edsker here. And for the department, I'm very impressed with the department here, because when we discussed Edsker, we saw Edsker whole. We saw him warts and all. And we decided to get him for all the right reasons. But now let me just tell you a little vignette in this, in this episode. Uh, so I met Rhea and Edsko at the airport, and I came with a bouquet of flowers for Rhea. And I, Rhea, I want you to know that you're the only woman in the whole world <laughs> that I've ever met at the airport with a bouquet of flowers. <laughs> <laughs> so then the, uh, the president and the dean at that time thought that um, the, the wise men of the university should have lunch with Edsko to, to invite him here. I think these are all the National Academy people and so on. And, and I, as this chair, was supposed to shepherd him along. So it's a little like introducing your parents to, uh, to your girlfriend from a completely different culture. And, and, and your parents want to be welcoming, but they don't know what to say. You know, this is a completely different culture. So we sit at this table in this room, and I'm really very anxious at this point. Uh, because I was very anxious to get Edsker here. Silence. Edsker isn't helping at all. He's just being silent. So these uh, very famous people, very, very smart people, uh, are trying to be welcoming, but again, they don't know where to begin. So I'd made a little uh, plan that uh, I'd talk about the weather, <laughs> the weather in case the silence got too deafening. And I'd, I'd thought I'd talk about the wind in Eindhoven compared with the wind in Austin uh, to get something going. <laughs> so I, I waited for a while and I was about to bring up my wind story when, uh, when one of the distinguished people said, I like programming. Ah, good. Right track. Then after a while he said, I like Fortran. <laughs> so, so I thought, my gosh, now we're in trouble. I was, <laughs> shall I bring up our wind story? I... <laughs> then he said, I like the go-to statement. <laughs> so, because it's so powerful. And he gave a very cogent description of how one would use a go-to statement to implement a procedure. <laughs> so at this point, I, was, I started bring my, bringing up my wind story. <laughs> 
I, I was blabbing incoherently. Um, but it turned out not to be necessary because uh, wise people are wise. And I think Etzker understood that the community was trying to welcome him. The community understood that Etzker was a wise man and everything worked out okay. Thank you, Etzker. So there is something that's been vexing to me about the program. The section we're in is called short remarks. I would have called it brief remarks, but then I remembered what short meant, and I noticed there were a lot of people from UT Austin who would get a chance to speak and have their last chance to talk to Etzker. The first of those is um, Alan Emerson. Okay. Um, over the years, I have learned from Edsker a massive amount of uh, technical information. But what I have learned from him most and what I have sought out from him uh, is insight into what is important and what is not. It would be simplest to say uh, at this point that my feelings and esteem for Edsker are ineffable. Uh, but I need a booster shot of simplicity, so I'm going to go on and say just a few things more. Uh, as a graduate student, uh, I read Edsker's uh, A Discipline of Programming, and it played a crucial role uh, in the very first uh, scientific paper that I wrote. So, Edsker, I want to thank you for this book. It was uh, of immeasurable use to me 20 years ago. Now, over the years, it's been my pleasure and my wife Lisa's pleasure to get to know Rhea and you as friends and we now count you among our very dearest and closest friends. We've had the pleasure of spending many enjoyable evenings in stimulating conversation. Now, it turns out I've learned some things about Edsger. In some small ways, we're alike. I'll tell you some minutia here. We're both very keen on Royal Stuart Plaid. And at, at, at various times of the year, I try to uh, help Edsker's wardrobe out in this regard. <laughs> We're also both very keen on Loden and Green. And I'll tell you something else about Edsker. While he appreciates a fine continental mill, he's also very, very keen on Texas barbecue. Uh, now, Edsker has uplifted my cultural standards. Edsker doesn't like fiction. I, on the other hand, uh, have historically been very keen on science fiction. I read a science fiction novel a week. Uh, but something has happened over the nearly two decades that I have known Edsker. Uh, no longer do I read science fiction. Um, maybe one book a year. I slip occasionally. I used to like to go to movies. As you know, Edsker doesn't care for going to movies. Um, no. Nope. I eschew movies now. I don't know how it happened. I suppose uh, TV is next. <laughs> Besides computer science, Don Knuth is largely responsible for uh, everybody's obsession starting in the early 80s with the minutia of typesetting. And there are generations of computer scientists who have spent countless hours fine-tuning the spacing of characters and so on. Um, this has also had a big effect on Edgar. Those of us who have been reading EWDs know he switched from a typewriter around the time of tech to a fountain pen, and then with Metafont, which allowed virtually anybody to compose any font uh, to a 
embossed seal which uh, adorns his uh, signed letters so that you can know that it is genuine EWD. Don? Thanks. Yeah, um, the, the program mentions that, uh, that one of the pleasures I've had uh, O over the years is is to uh, is to play four hands piano music with Edsger, uh, both in 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 uh, Netherlands in Noonan and also here in Austin. And uh, uh, I just wanted to tell you that uh, uh, when we're playing a uh, a Haydn waltz, uh, the thing I had to get used to was that Edsger doesn't count one two three one two three. It's always <laughs> zero one two zero one two. <coughs> Now, um, I uh, I also want to say something about his his famous book, Selected Writings on Computer Science. Um, uh, the first thing I noticed after getting a copy of the book was that it didn't have an index in it, and so I had to read the whole book in order to find out what he said about me. Uh, 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 now uh, the, the the reason, but 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 actually, uh, the, I, I have to also say in a more serious vein that the the I found it uh, uh, extremely impressive, especially in in one respect. There's a couple of uh, of the chapters in that book uh, talk about a function that he that he made up uh, as examples of his discipline of of programming. Uh, I, I'm not sure why he called it FUSC, F-U-S-C, but uh, but it's a it's a function that, he, that it's a, it's a uh, it's a very interesting mathematical function that that he came up uh, purely on on uh, uh, you know because of the discipline that he was following and following his instincts on it and and uh, he proved. Uh, uh, some remarkable theorems about this function, uh, we, and the, the last issue of the American Math Monthly, which came out two weeks ago, the April issue, has an article by uh, Herb Wilf and Neil Kalkin, where they, where their theorem is essentially the same uh, one that Edsger came up with by considering a computer program. Although these mathematicians are very fine mathematicians who. Uh, who who uh, were motivated by uh, completely different ways. Uh, it, it impressed me a lot that that the purely programming considerations would 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 lead Edsger to these uh, 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 to this very beautiful theorem, which is uh, uh, I, I don't want to go into the details, but it's a it's it's the the simplest known way to uh, to enumerate all the rational numbers. Um, uh, it, uh, there's a sequence. Uh, um, a, a1, a2, a3, and so on, where, the, where you get all the rational numbers as the, in the following way, a1 over a2, comma, a2 over a3, comma, a3 over a4, and so on. And that gives you exact, every rational exactly once, and, and it, it comes out of this, this fuss function, and it was, it was, the, it w it was something that, uh, that, that, as I say, uh, uh, I, I found extremely uh, 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 nice that, it, that the programming methodology would lead to something new like this. Uh, the, um, once I gave a talk at Eindhoven, um, uh, and uh, and I had planned secretly to use a go-to statement in, in my in, in my talk, and I and I you know I, I wrote down this algorithm in English on the board, and um, and I, I did step one and step two and step three, and then I. And then I, you know, pretended to, to to be alarmed, and I paused, and I said, "Oh, oh!" And I said, "Is it is it allowed to use a go-to statement in Eindhoven?" And as you said, I knew this was coming. So, <laughs> so um, now, uh, once I wrote a paper called uh, a, a generalization of Dijkstra's algorithm, and uh, and in this paper, uh, well, the basic idea of it was that 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 uh, Edgar's algorithm for shortest paths. Uh, which everyone knows, uh, 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 you can consider it as a as a uh, as a method for finding the uh, uh, the word of minimum weight in a uh, in a regular language in a, in a finite state language, and and I generalize this to find a uh, word of minimum weight in a context-free language, and so I showed the I showed my paper to Edsger and asked him, uh, you know, if he, 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 you know, isn't this great and so on, and he said, well, it was it was a good result, but uh, I wish you hadn't used dot 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 so much um, in, in it, and uh, 
and I, I think my answer was, well, it's the only way I could inv avoid so many subscripts. But uh, no, no. Now, so, so, but I, I'd like to finish by just stating that as an open problem. It, uh, some of you to take a look at that paper and see how you can do it without dot 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 and without subscripts. The next speaker should be known to all of you. Vicki Almstrom not only started off the meeting this morning as session chair, but she was one of the organizers. Vicki. I'd like to start by telling you the rest of the story of something that Fred started this evening. 1979, I was a starry-eyed graduate student who got this large flyer about the Western Institute in Computer Science Programming Methodology Lecture Series. The names were all of the names on my textbooks, and I said, well, they have scholarships. I'm going to apply. Maybe I'll get one. I got one. I went, and I met an amazing roster of people, heard amazing lectures, saw amazing interactions. Among the people that I met were some Swedes who told me about the very inter interesting incident during the lectures, during the weeks before the uh, lecture series began, when Dijkstra, as the earthquake began, just sort of paused, looked a little irritated, and then continued. They were all very impressed. Recently, he was uh, talking to Suzanne and happened to mention this. And he said he was very irritated because he thought it was a large truck going past. <laughs> I, in my second incarnation as a graduate student, was here at the University of Texas at Austin. And I put off taking a course called Capita Selectra because I felt rather intimidated. I thought, well, I'm not ready for that yet. It's one of my great regrets that I didn't take that course much sooner because I think that it would have made very many positive effects in my career. Once I did get brave enough to sign up for that course, I saw a master teacher. The way in which the information was presented, the thoughtfulness, the kindness to the students was very touching, very much a learning experience besides the material that we were being taught. The end of the semester is always, for each student, a private two-hour oral interview that is very intimidating before you do it the first time, but I discovered was one of the most meaningful experiences. It is a one-on-one -on -one to explore topics and to learn and to be taught as you're demonstrating, as you're understanding the material. Just absolutely a wonderful experience. Since becoming a faculty member here, I've been teaching software engineering for the last three years. And the first semester I was teaching it, we kept coming across Edsker W. Dijkstra did this, Edsker W. Dijkstra said that. And so just almost on a whim, I asked, well, would you be willing to come and speak for my students? And he consented, and I'm happy to say it's become a tradition. He's now, since uh, six semesters ago, spoken for about 400 students that have been taking the software engineering course with me. One of the things that I asked them to do is to complete journal entries, to talk about their experiences and to share some of the impressions that they got. They don't all get it. A lot of them, he presents these programs using this funny notation, and he's very careful about talking about the proof. And you know, a lot of them just don't get it. But many of them do. And I am incredibly grateful to him for continuing to share with these students. And I'm hopeful that even though he's in retirement, I may be able to talk him into perhaps doing it some more in the future. So thank you so much for everything you've taught. Next, from the UT Austin Mafia, we'll hear from Vladimir Lipschitz. Uh, many people talked during the uh, meeting today and the, this reception about the influence that the possibility to uh, learn from Edsger had on their uh, professional work. And uh, most of these people 
uh, actually met Esger first when they were young, when they were students. With me it was different because by the time I first met Esger, I had been doing mathematics for something like 25 years. And I want to tell you that it didn't make any difference. Once I started listening to what Esger was saying, um, it um, affected my work um, in, in many ways. And I started doing mathematics and uh, writing it and uh, teaching it in, in, um, uh, in different ways. But what was even more important for me is something that um, uh, Edgar said once when he talked to a group of students. He talked about the university as an institution, about the place of the university um, uh, in the society in which we live. Um, and he explained that uh, universities encourage us to um, think freely and to uh, speak up uh, without fear, no matter how paradoxical or um, strange our, our conclusions can be, to the degree to which no other institution uh, does. And uh, this helped me understand uh, how fortunate I am to be able to spend my life in a community like this. Thank you, Edsger. One wonders if they were told they had to sing for their supper. Next from UT Austin is Vijaya Ramachandran. I first visited Austin 12 years ago in the spring of 1988 when I interviewed here for a faculty position. The first person I met during this visit was Edsger W. Dykstra, who received me at the airport and took me to my hotel and graciously spent some time chatting with me in the hotel lobby. I was at that time an untenured assistant professor, and needless to say, I was quite overwhelmed by this extraordinary welcome. So I guess it's not surprising that I accepted the offer from UT Austin. <laughs> Soon after I joined UT Austin, I, I was happy to be invited to join ATAC. I must confess that in the initial stages, I was rather mystified at its purpose. After all, I had come to Austin from the outside world of American computing science, and everyone knows of Edsger's opinion of American computing science, for instance, in EWD 1157, EWD 1209, EWD 1284. <laughs> Since I am a theoretician, I did not bear the brunt of Edsger's scathing remarks on American computing science, but still, I was an American-style theoretician, and those first few ATAC meetings were a culture shock. However, over the years, I have gained an immense appreciation of Edsger's goal of pursuing simplicity, and I have tried to apply it wherever I can. I must confess that even today, I will forge ahead with an ugly proof if that is the only way I'm able to prove a result. However, thanks to Edsger, I will strive that extra day to look for a simpler and more elegant proof. On the personal side, I've appreciated the warmth and openness of Edsger during my years here in Austin, and I've also enjoyed the hospitality of Ria and Edsger at various occasions. Thank you, Edsger and Ria. So Edsger is retiring from the, uh, the arduous career of being a university professor, presumably to devote lots of time to uh, research and writing. Uh, Doug McElroy, the next speaker, is somebody who retired from that kind of a nirvana, that is being a researcher at Bell Labs, to a university, uh, to Dartmouth College. Doug? I'm sorry, Vlad, I have to trump you. I met Dykstra, Edsger Dykstra in 1964. Well, you got taller. Yeah. <laughs> it, was at, it was at the Formal Language Description Languages Conference 
at Baden by Wien in Vienna attached to a meeting of WG 2.1, which was beginning to do battle over Algol 68. The, I was at there as an observer representing PL1, perhaps the last time I really enjoyed working on something complex. Uh, I was seated in a back corner at a table, and uh, as an observer, the not allowed to speak unless spoken to during the 2.1 meeting. But following that came the conference. There were a number of luminaries whose name I recognized because all of them had signed the Algol 60 report. There were plenty of others. The first time in that meeting that I became conscious of Edgar's acerbic side was during a talk by Schützenberger. Edgar had not by that time learned the trick of s taking a seat on the aisle so that he could get up and, s and steam around a little bit before giving his comments. He spoke up from the middle of the audience after a talk on free monoids and said, do your strings have end markers? To which Schützenberger, in a most angelic way, looked to the heavens and said, I'm not talking about strings. I'm talking about free monoids. But it was at that meeting where Van Weingarten gave a talk on substituting the go-to out of existence, which was an interesting uh, tour de force in reducing the size of our, our, of, our, of our vocabulary in programming languages. But, you know, it was just an interesting exercise. It could be done. The next day, at coffee hour, one of the more memorable experiences of my life happened. We were sitting around a, a small table, somewhat round table, somewhat smaller than the dining tables here, and Edsger whipped out a napkin and started writing. He had seen far more in Van Weingarten's talk than the rest of us. He said, I can program without the go-to. And there he wrote before us algorithm after algorithm without the go-to. He invented also, I think he called it quit, but everybody else now knows it as the break statement in C. And from that day forth, we all started avoiding the go-to. It was just a wonderful thing to see this new insight came in one day. Those of us who read the EWD series have noticed that there are various themes that recur and there are various plots that appear and then disappear. I, I confess I used to read the ones with the words first and then go back and read the ones with the mathematics. And amongst the ones with the words, which were usually philosophical, was a series about mathematics, Inc., which was Edsger's way of poking fun at uh, mathematics and theoretical computer science and the computer science industry. Well, many a jest is said in truth and there is today a company that might be called Mathematics Inc. It's called Akamai, and it's a company of a bunch of theoreticians who have gotten together and made a fortune on caching in the Internet. The next speaker, uh, although is listed as being at UT Austin, actually is currently on leave at Akamai. That would be Greg Plaxton, who is a theoretician. Greg?
Um, please excuse the prepared text. I'm not too good at these kinds of occasions. First and foremost, I'd like to express my sincere thanks to Edsger for allowing me to attend his ATAC seminars. Uh, they opened my eyes and mind to some really interesting ideas um, and have had a lot of influence on both the style and content of my subsequent research. Um, I'd also like to say a few words on the subject of retirement. Of course, I don't have any direct experience in this area. Uh, <laughs> But my father, who is almost exactly the same age as Edsger, uh, left the practice of law a couple of years ago. And so I've recently had the opportunity uh, to observe his transition to retirement. Uh, throughout his career, my dad was pretty focused on work and didn't have much time for outside activities. We used to say that his main sport was hopscotch, uh, but without the hopping. <laughs> So when he retired, my mother and sisters and I were, were more than a little concerned about <laughs> what he would do with himself. Um, as it happens, my dad has become engrossed in a sequence of projects of ever-increasing scale and ambition. Uh, for instance, this past fall and winter, he and two other guys from his woodworking class built a barn. <laughs> <laughs> I guess he enjoyed the physical exertion associated with barn building because his current project, which should be completed this very weekend, is a five-week, 800-kilometer walk from the French Pyrenees to the westernmost point of Spain. And for the summer, my dad plans to outdo himself yet again by taking up an apprenticeship uh, in a shipbuilding yard on the Great Lakes. <laughs> By the way, Edsker, my dad says there might be an op opening for you at the yard. Uh, maybe, maybe something in the scraping and sanding division. Anyway, the point of all this rambling is that if, if there's one form of freedom that puts even academic freedom to shame. It's the sort of freedom that comes with retirement. So, Edsger, I'd like to congratulate you on reaching this milestone, which I hope only marks the beginning of the re most rewarding stage of your life. All the best. Thank you. For some, being a researcher is about having impact. And the next speaker, Nicholas Wert, has had lots of impact. He's a language designer par excellence. But he's also the only computer scientist about whom I know there is a joke. And I will share it with you. Why is he called Klaus Wert had a home and Nicholas Wert, Nicholas Wert in the US? And the answer, of course, is in Europe, they use call by name. And in the US, it's call by value. <laughs> Nicholas. It was mentioned today that I'm one of the oldest acquaintances of, of Edsger, dating back to the 1962 IFIP Congress. <laughs> Uh, for a while I believed it myself, but of course it needs to be pointed out that at those times our relationships have not been quite symmetric. And uh, I was a, a graduate student at Berkeley and went to this congress and why did I want to see Edsger Dijkstra? Because I didn't know him but I knew of him. Uh, I got involved in computers and in particular software and compiler design uh, back in 1960 and uh, that was the time when the Algol 60 report had come out and uh, presented uh, one shimmer of light at the horizon that uh, some more order and 
scientific approach could enter that messy field of programming that uh, was in practice. I still remember that compiler I was confronted with. Uh, it was a huge thing, uh, no principles, just a lot of tricks. And there was only one single woman who had access to all these tricks. And for the others it remained mystery. So the, other, the only alternative was to do something new and bring method and scientific approach into this field. And that was, of course, an ideal subject for somebody who was looking for a thesis topic. Yes, and uh, then, uh, 1961, I think, I believe, we received some news and some reports, gray A4 pamphlets from a certain Edsker W. Dijkstra, uh, describing his implementation, believed to be the first full implementation of alcohol. And we read that with keen interest, and uh, I must confess, I learned a lot of technical stuff. And of course, what I said, method and discipline. And that these are, as we all know by now, the hallmarks of Edsker Dijkstra. Well, this is the way I got into this alcohol working group, 2.1, this famous or, or infamous working group. And I got to know Edsker more personally. Um, so maybe, maybe, yeah, I should say something about commonalities first before I talk about differences, shouldn't I? Uh, well, one common trait we have, he being a Dutch and I being a Swiss, we both dislike cheese. <laughs> so that with one full sweep made him very sympathetic to me. Um, but of course there were differences too. Uh, one that uh, just came to my mind while I was listening to these talks, and it, 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 it's very, very important you learn that from Edsker. If there are differences, stick to your guns. I mean, don't just bow your head because he's a celebrity and say, this is wonderful. Um, and one of these things is uh, his principle was that one should never teach by example. I mean, that's kind of treason to the scientific and to the mathematical mind. You first state the laws and, uh, and, uh, and they explain everything. And perhaps if you have some dumbbells in your class, you may deliver an example, an application for that. <laughs> well, uh, I myself uh, uh, never had learned this way, and I found that, that many people, or actually few people, are that way. Most are helped tremendously if you give them, introduce the subject with a few examples, and then come the laws, and then they make sense. So uh, my message here is don't believe everything he says, you know. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, and, and I also found that uh, Edsker was really tremendous as far as mathematics and, and principles went, but he, that was at least my feeling, he didn't have enough feeling for the, the troubles that engineers experience, and the engineers are actually the people who, who carry the world through the desert, you know, the others just uh, paint clouds. So, uh, once he visited uh, us at DTH in Zurich, and I was very proud to show to the master my work and explaining some of the difficulties I encountered, being well aware that there would probably be difficulties if, which he understood if he had cared about, but I was sure he wouldn't care about them. We had uh, one of these rather unfortunate machines uh, CDC call with an instruction set, now it's called RISC, but certainly not particularly well suited for our tasks of implementing algol and higher level languages in an elegant way. And I tried to explain to him with the difficulties I had been fighting with and uh, the concessions one had to make and so on. And, uh, well, he, of course, uh, had a somewhat haughty look, you know, and then he said, well, yeah, I didn't expect anything else uh, from, a, from a genuine Swiss Puritan. <laughs> and then I, I, 
I was a bit puzzled, but I knew enough that I wouldn't take this as exactly a compliment. <laughs> so, so I asked him to explain, and then he said something like, well, the Puritans are people who, who have learned to love their miseries. <laughs> Thank you. The last set of comments in this section of the program are from somebody from Amsterdam, which seems all that well suitable. Anne Caldwell? Caldwell. I will not talk uh, about Amsterdam, but uh, better about Eindhoven. And I will talk uh, tomorrow, I have some more time. Uh, about uh, my personal uh, things that happened with Eska. Uh, I, I only th three short remarks. In 1984, you left Eindhoven. And the first remark is, it was terrible that you left. And the second one is, and that's clear from tonight too, it was the right thing to do. And the last thing is, you succeeded in not leaving us. Thank you very much. You may have noticed that it's raining. In fact, it's raining quite hard. And we don't want to send you out into the rain to get wet, so we'll go off the program. There are some people who we haven't heard from and seen, and we should. First, Lynn Pierce. Hi, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a PhD candidate in the department here and also a member of the Tuesday Afternoon Club. I was honored to be asked to make a few remarks tonight, and I should say that some of these remarks have been anticipated by other speakers, but that will, in context, seem a very delightful thing. So. Anyone who knows Edsker W. Dykstra well has almost certainly met another very special person, a woman with beautiful blue eyes and a marvelous smile. No tribute to Edsker would be complete without a recognition of his wife, Rhea, and her contributions to his and many other lives. Maria C. Dykstra de Betz completed her formal education at the RK Lyceum voor Meisjes in Amsterdam, and I should mention parathetically that I've almost certainly mispronounced that. But since my primary sources on the pronunciation of the Dutch language were not supposed to know I was giving this, <laughs> you just have to bear with me. She then went on to the Mathematical Center in Amsterdam, where she continued her mathematical training as part of her work as a calculator and later as a programmer. It was during her employment there that she met Edsker, and showing a spectacular combination of good taste and courage, she later became his wife. <laughs> Since that time, she has been many things to many people on multiple continents. In a personal capacity, she is wife, proud mother and grandmother, colleague, companion, and friend. She's a master craftswoman, especially in the art of quilting, and shares this art with others as a beekeeper for the Quilters Guild. Her accomplishments in the craft are illustrated by her completion of a difficult and elaborate quilt in the classic Mariner's Star pattern. And her personal charm is exemplified by the fact that she gave the finished piece away to a friend. And in addition to all of this, she has continued to use her mathematical talents to support and assist Edgar in his work. Thank you, Rhea, for being yourself and for all you bring into many other lives. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in saluting Rhea Dykstra our own Yellow Rose of Texas.
That is wonder. Oh, oh, oh. Well. <laughs> It'll be fine. <laughs> they can stand up. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's right. Well, thank you. That was that was wonderful. I'm Ben Kuypers, chairman of the department. And before I start saying a few more remarks about Edgar, see where did Edgar go? <laughs> he left. Oops. Ah, okay. Or to get rid of water. Well, that's too bad. <laughs> so let's see if we can find Edgar. Um, in the meantime, what? He is, uh, indisposed. indisposed at the moment. Okay. Maybe we should plan something. <laughs> yes, right, exactly. We should all hop. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, one thing I would like to do, and, um, it's a shame to do this with Edgar out of the room, but um, I would like to especially give thanks to the committee here that did the work for um, creating this occasion. And <coughs> um, that committee consists of Steve Keckler, Vicki Almstrom, Jay Misra, Suzanne Rhodes, and Ham Richards. So. I'd also like to thank the staff members uh, in the computer science department who put an enormous amount of work into making the occasion happen and helped it, helped it proceed as smoothly and effortlessly, uh, apparently effortlessly, uh, as, as it has. Um, and these are Lori Alvarez, Diane Driscoll, Elizabeth Mendelman, and Jem Nevier. Now, I'd like to make a few of my own remarks about Edgar. Um, Edgar Dykstra, of course, as we've been saying throughout this, has been an inspiration to us all. Um, in 1972, as a beginning graduate student at MIT, I heard him give a talk that still lives in my memory. He showed a simple, beautifully stated sorting algorithm and <clears throat> described it as a beautiful little pearl of an algorithm. Then he showed another beautiful little algorithm and said it was another beautiful little pearl of an algorithm. The big difference was that the second pearl ran a great deal faster than the first pearl and, so, and went on to explain uh, the differences between these. Around the same time, um, I read his Turing Award lecture, The Humble Programmer, which also had a lot of impact on me um, for its message of humility in the face of the great complexity of the problems that we have before us. Simplicity and clarity of thought are two of the tools that he has demonstrated so eloquently um, that we have to deal with these challenges. It's been a pleasure over the years to be his colleague. I've enjoyed arguing with him from time to time about the virtues of artificial intelligence, um, which, which <coughs> I consider which I consider to be one of the great intellectual challenges of the century, requiring both courage and humility, uh, like the challenge of programming. Uh, Edgar, um, in his incorrect views of this, this topic, ha ha has been uh, influenced, I'm sorry to say, by the undeniable bogosity that occasionally manifests itself in this uh, otherwise wonderful area. <laughs> now, the, the intellectual life of the university relies on strong, clear advocates for important landmark positions. And the tensions among these clear positions give rise to the greatest and most creative discoveries. Edgar, as we've, as we've heard, is no stranger to creative tension and creative argument that have given rise to many of the greatest discoveries in computing science.
His strong, clear thinking has enriched us all. We'd like to thank you, and on behalf of the department, I'd like to present you with a little token of this occasion, which <coughs> commemorates Edgar Dyke's greatest hits. <laughs> It would only be fair to let Edgar have the last word. So let me introduce to you Edgar Dijkstra. Well, after all you have heard about me, it's quite clear that I should pause <laughs> and think about polite things to say. Uh, I think I should not say anything about myself anymore. The topic is a little bit worn out. Uh, with respect to this evening, the whole symposium, uh, I'm touched. It's very enjoyable and a little bit moving. But I honestly enjoy the experience. I mean, and with respect to UT in general, uh, I must say that I'm extremely glad that 16 years ago, on the 29th of February 1984 to be precise, Ria and I took the decision to accept the invitation and to come to the United States. Um, we expect to go back once upon a time, but we love this place so much that we are not in a hurry. Thank you all. <laughs>